Chapter 49 Amid the Ruins The thick gray clouds parted, and from his place on Saphir's back, Aragon beheld the interior of Rowengard Island. Before them was a huge bowl-shaped valley, encircled by the steep mountains they had seen poking through the tops of the clouds. A dense forest of spruce, pine, and fir trees blanketed the sides of the mountains as well as the foothills below, like an army of prickly soldiers marching down from the peaks. The trees were tall and mournful, and even from a distance Aragon could see the beards of moss and lichen that hung from their heavy branches. Scraps of white mist clung to the sides of the mountains, and in several places throughout the valley, diffuse curtains of rain drifted from the ceiling of clouds. High above the valley floor, Aragon could see a number of stone structures among the trees, tumbled, overgrown entrances to caves, the husks of burnt-out towers, grand halls with collapsed roofs, and a few smaller buildings that looked as if they might still be habitable. A dozen or more rivers flowed out of the mountains and wandered across the verdant ground until they poured into a large, still lake near the center of the valley. Around the lake lay the remnants of the rider's city, Doru Arabea. The buildings were immense, great empty halls of such enormous proportions that many could have encompassed the whole of Carvajal. Every door was like a mouth to a vast, unexplored cavern. Every window was as tall and wide as a castle gate, and every wall was a sheer cliff. Thick mats of ivy strangled the blocks of stone, and where there was no ivy, there was moss which meant that the buildings blended into the landscape and looked as if they had grown out of the earth itself. What little of the stone was bare tended to a pale ochre, although patches of red, brown, and dusky blue were also visible. As with all elf-made structures, the buildings were graceful and flowing and more attenuated than those of dwarves or humans. But they also possessed a solidity and authority that the treehouses of Elismira lacked. In some of them, Aragon described similarities to houses in Palancar Valley, and he remembered that the earliest human riders had come from that very part of Alangasia. The result was a unique style of architecture, neither entirely elvish nor entirely human. Almost all of the buildings were damaged, some more severely than others. The damage seemed to radiate outward from a single point near the southern edge of the city, where a wide crater sank more than thirty feet into the ground. A copse of birch trees had taken root in the depression, and their silvery leaves shook in the gusts of the directionless breeze. The open areas within the city were overgrown with weeds and brush, while a fringe of grass surrounded each of the flagstones that formed the streets. Where the buildings had sheltered the riders' gardens from the blast that had ravaged the city, dull-colored flowers still grew in artful designs, their shapes no doubt governed by the dictates of some long-forgotten spell. Altogether, the circular valley presented a dismal picture. "'Behold the ruins of our pride and glory,' said Glader. Then, "'Aragon, you must cast another spell. The wording of it goes thus.' And he uttered several lines in the ancient language. It was an odd spell. The phrasing was obscure and convoluted, and Aragon was unable to determine what it was supposed to accomplish. When he asked Glader, the old dragon said, "'There is an invisible poison here.' In the air you breathe, in the ground you walk upon, and in the food you may eat and the water you may drink. The spell will protect us against it. What? Poison? asked Sephira, her thoughts as slow as the beats of her wings. Aragon saw from Glader an image of the crater by the city, and the dragon said, During the battle with the Forsworn, one of our own, an elf by the name of Thuviel, Killed himself with magic, whether by design or by accident has never been clear. But the result is what you see and what you cannot see, for the resulting explosion rendered the area unfit to live in. Those who remained here soon developed lesions upon their skin and lost their hair, and many died thereafter. Concerned, Aragon cast the spell, which required little energy, before he said, how could any one person, elf or not, cause so much damage? Even if Thuviel's dragon helps him, I can't think how it would be possible, not unless his dragon was the size of a mountain. His dragon did not help him, said Glader. His dragon was dead, 
No, Nuviel wrought this destruction by himself. But how? The only way he could have. He converted his flesh into energy. He made himself into a spirit? No. The energy was without thought or structure, and once unbound, it raced outward until dispersed. I had not realized that a single body contained so much force. It is not well known, but even the smallest speck of matter is equal to a great amount of energy. Matter, it seems, is merely frozen energy. Melt it, and you release a flood few can withstand. It was said that the explosion here was heard as far away as term, and that the cloud of smoke that followed rose as high as the Bior Mountains. Was it the blast that killed Glayrun? Aragon asked, referring to the one member of the Forsworn who he knew had died on Vrongard. It was. Galvadorix and the rest of the Forsworn had a moment of warning, and so were able to shield themselves. But many of our own were not as fortunate, and thus perished. As Saphira glided downward from the underside of the low-slung clouds, Glader instructed her where to fly, so she altered her course, turning toward the northwestern part of the valley. Glader named each of the mountains as she flew past, Ilfairos, Felsverd, and Nemenmest, along with Hudrim and Tinadrim. He also named many of the holds and fallen towers below, and he gave something of their history to Aragon and Saphira, although only Aragon paid heed to the old dragon's narration. Within Glader's consciousness, Aragon felt an ancient sorrow reawaken. The sorrow was not so much for the destruction of Dora Arabea as for the deaths of the riders, the near extinction of the dragons, and the loss of thousands of years of knowledge and wisdom. The memory of what had been, of the companionship he had once shared with the other members of his order, exasperated Glader's loneliness. That, along with his sorrow, created a mood of such desolation, Aragon began to feel saddened as well. He withdrew slightly from Glader, but still the valley seemed gloomy and melancholy, as if the land itself were mourning the fall of the riders. The lower Saphira flew, the larger the buildings appeared. As their true size became evident, Aragon realized that what he had read in Domia Abuerda was no exaggeration. The grandest of them were so enormous, Saphira would be able to fly within them. Near the edge of the abandoned city, he began to notice piles of giant white bones upon the ground, the skeletons of dragons. The sight filled him with revulsion, and yet he could not bring himself to look elsewhere. What struck him most was their size. A few of the dragons had been smaller than Saphira, but most had been far larger. The biggest he saw was a skeleton with ribs that he guessed were at least 80 feet long and perhaps 15 feet wide at their thickest. The skull alone, a huge, fierce thing covered with blotches of lichen, like a rough crag of stone, was longer and taller than the main part of Saphir's body. Even Glader, when he was still clothed in flesh, would have appeared diminutive next to the slain dragon. There lies Belgabad, the greatest of us all said Glader, as he noticed the object of Aragon's attention. Aragon vaguely remembered the name from one of the histories he had read in Elismira. The author had written only that Beglabad had been present at the battle, and that he perished in the fighting, as so many had. Who was his rider? he asked. He had no rider. He was a wild dragon. For centuries, he lived alone in the icy reaches of the north. But when Galvatorx and the Forsworn began to slaughter our kind. He flew to our aid. Was he the largest dragon ever? Ever? No. But at that time, yes. How did he find enough to eat? At that age and at that size, dragons spend most of their time in a sleep-like trance, dreaming of whatever happens to capture their fancy, be it the turning of the stars, or the rise and the fall of the mountains over the eons, or even something as small as the motion of a butterfly's wings. Already I feel the lure of such repose, but awake I am needed, and awake I shall stay. Did you know Beglabad? asked Saphira, forcing the words through her fatigue. 
I met him, but I did not know him. Wild dragons did not, as a rule, consort with those of us who were bonded with riders. They looked down on us for being too tame and too compliant, while we looked down on them for being too driven by their instincts, although sometimes we admired them for the same. Also, you must remember, they had no language of their own, and that created a greater difference between us than you might think. Language alters your mind in ways that are hard to explain. Wild dragons could communicate as effectively as any elf or dwarf, of course, but they did so by sharing memories, images, and sensations, not words. Only the more cunning of them chose to learn this or any other tongue. Glader paused, and then he added, If I recall correctly, Baglabad was a distant ancestor of Rogmar the Black, and Rogmar, as I'm sure you remember, Severa, was the great, great, great grandsire of your mother, Vevada. In her exhaustion, Safira was slow to react, but at last she twisted her neck to again look at the vast skeleton. He must have been a very good hunter to grow so big. He was the very best, said Glitter. Then I am glad to be of his blood. The number of bones scattered across the ground staggered Aragon. Until then, he had fully comprehended neither the extent of the battle nor how many dragons there had once been. The sight renewed his hate for Galvatorix, and once again Aragon swore that he would see the king dead. Saphira sank through a band of mist, the white haze rolling off the tips of her wings like tiny whirlpools set within the sky. Then a field of tangled grass rushed up at her, and she landed with a heavy jolt. Her right foreleg gave way beneath her, and she lurched to the side and fell on her chest and shoulder, plowing into the ground with such force that Aragon would have impaled himself on the next spike in front of him, had it not been for his wards. Once her forward slide ceased, Saphira lay motionless, stunned by the impact. Then she slowly rolled onto her feet, folded her wings, and settled into a low crouch. The straps on the saddle creaked as she moved, the sound unnaturally loud in the hushed atmosphere that pervaded the interior of the island. Aragon pulled loose the bands around his legs, then jumped all the way to the ground. It was wet and soft, and he dropped onto one knee as his boots sank into the damp earth. We made it, he said, amazed. He walked forward to Saphira's head, and when she lowered her neck so that she could look him in the eye, he placed his hands on either side of her long head and pressed his forehead against her snout. Thank you, he said. He heard the snick as her eyelids closed, and then her head began to vibrate as she hummed deep in her chest. After a moment, Aragon released her and turned to look at their surroundings. The field Saphira had landed in was on the northern outskirts of the city. Pieces of cracked masonry, some as large as Saphira herself, lay scattered throughout the grass. Aragon was relieved she had avoided striking any. The field sloped upward, away from the city, to the base of the nearest foothill, which was covered with forest. Where field and hill met, a large paved square had been cut flat into the ground, and at the far side of the square sat a massive pile of dressed stone that stretched to the north for over half a mile. Intact, the building would have been one of the largest on the island, and certainly one of the most ornate, for among the square blocks of stone that formed the walls, Aragon spotted dozens of fluted pillars, as well as carved panels depicting vines and flowers, and a whole host of statues, most of which were missing some combination of body parts, as if they too had participated in the battle. There lies the great library, said Glader, or what remains after Galbatorix plundered it. Aragon slowly turned as he inspected the surrounding area. To the south of the library, he saw the faint lines of abandoned footpaths underneath the shaggy pelts of grass. The paths led away from the library to a grove of apple trees that hid the ground from view, but rising behind the trees was a jagged spar of stone well over two hundred feet tall, upon which grew several gnarled junipers. A spark of excitement formed within Aragon's chest. He was sure, but still he asked, Is that it? Is that the Rock of Cuthian? He could feel Glader using his eyes to look at the formation, and then the dragon said, 
It seems oddly familiar, but I cannot remember when I might have seen it before. Aragon needed no other confirmation. Come on, he said. He waded through the waist-high grass toward the nearest path. There the grass was not quite so thick, and he could feel hard cobblestones under his feet instead of rain-soaked earth. With Saphir close behind, he hurried down the path, and together they walked through the shadowed grove of apple trees. Both of them stepped with care, for the trees seemed alert and watchful, and something about the shape of their branches was ominous, as if the trees were waiting to ensnare them with splintered claws. Without meaning to, Aragon breathed a sigh of relief when they emerged from the grove. The Rock of Cuthian stood upon the edge of a large clearing wherein grew a tangled pool of roses, thistles, raspberries, and water hemlock. Beyond the stone prominence stood row upon row of drooping fir trees, which extended all the way back to the mountain that loomed high above. The angry chatter of squirrels echoed among the boles of the forest, but of the animals themselves, not so much as a whisker was to be seen. Three stone benches, their shapes half-hidden beneath layers of roots, vines, and creepers, were situated at equal distances around the clearing. Off to the side was a willow tree, whose latticework trunk had once served as a bower where the riders might sit and enjoy the view. But in the past hundred years, the trunk had grown too thick for any man, elf, or dwarf to slip into the space within. Aragon stopped at the edge of the clearing and stared at the Rock of Cuthian. Beside him, Sephira woofed and dropped onto her belly, shaking the ground and causing him to bend his knees to keep his balance. He rubbed her on the shoulder, then turned his gaze back to the Tower of Rock. A sense of nervous anticipation welled up inside him. Opening his mind, Aragon searched the clearing and the trees beyond for anyone who might be waiting to ambush them. The only living things he sensed were plants, insects, and the moles, mice, and garter snakes that lived among the brush in the clearing. Then he started to compose the spells that he hoped would allow him to, d to detect any magical traps in the area. Before he had put more than a few words together, Glader said, Stop! You and Zephira are too tired for this now. Rest first. Tomorrow we can return and see what we may discover. But the two of you are in no condition to defend yourselves if we must fight. Whatever we are supposed to find will still be here in the morn. Aragon hesitated, then reluctantly abandoned the spell. He knew Glader was right, but he hated to wait any longer when the completion of their quest was so close at hand. Very well, he said, and climbed back onto Sephira. With a weary huff, she rose to her feet, then slowly turned around and trudged once more through the grove of apple trees. The heavy impact of her steps shook loose withered leaves from the canopy, one of which landed in Aragon's lap. He picked it up and was about to throw it away when he noticed that the leaf was shaped differently than it ought to be. The teeth along the edge were longer and wider than those of any apple leaf he had seen before, and the veins formed seemingly random patterns, instead of the regular network of lines he would have expected. He picked another leaf, this one still green. Like its desiccated cousin, the fresh leaf had larger serrations and a confused map of veins. Ever since the battle... Things here have not been as they once were, said Glader. Aragon frowned and tossed away the leaves. Again he heard the chatter of the squirrels, and again he failed to see any among the trees, nor was he able to feel them with his mind, which concerned him. If I had scales, this place would make them itch, he said to Sephira. A small puff of smoke rose from her nostrils as she snorted with amusement. From the grove... She walked south until she came to one of the many streams that flowed out of the mountains, a thin white brook that burbled softly as it tumbled over a bed of rocks. There Sophia turned and followed the water upstream to a sheltered meadow near the forefront of the evergreen forest. Here, said Sophia, and she sank to the ground. It looked a good place to make camp, and Sophia was in no condition to keep searching, so Aragon agreed and dismounted. He paused for a moment to appreciate the view over the valley. Then he removed the saddle and the saddlebags from Sephira, whereupon she shook her head, rolled her shoulders, and then twisted her neck to nibble at a spot on the side of her chest where the straps had been chafing. Without further ado, she curled up in the grass, tucked her head under her wing, and wrapped her tail around herself. "'Do not wake me unless something is trying to eat us,' she said. Aragon smiled and patted her on the tail, 
then turned to look at the valley again. He stood there for a long while, barely thinking, content to observe and exist without making any effort to coax meaning from the world around him. At last he fetched his bedroll, which he laid out beside Sephira. "'Will you keep watch for us?' he asked Glader. "'I shall keep watch. Rest, and do not worry.' Aragon nodded, even though Glader could not see him, and then he lowered himself onto the blankets and allowed himself to drift off into the embrace of his waking dreams.' 